All right, so thanks for joining us today. Um, this the Blue Horizons project is a uh, funded by the city and the county um, about becoming 100% clean energy by 2042 in Buncombe County. And so it's got a lot, a lot of different pieces. And one of them is educating folks about what they need to do in their own house. So before I get started, um, Aaron, since you're our sole person right now, you get like custom treatment. Uh, do you have any particular things that you want us to cover? Or are you just looking for a broad overview? If you have any specific questions, you can type them in the chat or you're welcome to unmute and ask it verbally, but either way, uh, definitely make sure that we touch on the things that you need to touch on uh, for your situation. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm here to attend. Um, just a general overview would be great. Uh, we just moved uh, into our first home. So I'm gonna start with that. Some general would be good and we haven't really assessed anything here yet. Congratulations, that's really exciting. Um, yeah, thanks. We're excited to be here. Nice. Uh, so this will go over a, a broad range of things that you, we can focus on. Your house will be a custom situation. Every house is. So there's particular things that we can go more into detail to, to today. I'm happy to do that. So the initiative, as I said before, is uh, it's called the Blue Horizons Project. It's uh, City of Asheville, Buncombe County, and Duke Energy is a, is a part of it, and we're trying to make them a bigger part of it because we need them for a couple of our goals. Um, the the three things that the project is trying to do is we're trying to electrify everything, and you'll see these coming out in the presentation. Electrify everything, green the grid, and embrace efficiency. So how do you waste less energy at home? The real challenge of efficiency is balancing comfort comfort with energy savings so you want to have a comfortable house but you want to do it for less energy so by do it changing behaviors and installing different things in your house you can improve uh energy uh efficiency at home without sacrificing comfort so why do you care about energy efficiency well i already i said two of them are there are there others that uh Aaron, or or maybe even Summer, make you care about energy efficiency? Yeah, um, I guess just you know, saving money, uh, just wasting a little bit less uh, as every grid is kind of moving towards renewables. Hopefully, uh, you know, limiting use of fossil fuels while we have, while we can. All right, my mute button is hidden next to the go forward button. So uh, yeah, those are really great reasons. Uh, climate change, environmental benefits. One of the things that I think that people forget, actually there's two. One is um, it can reduce moisture and mold. So you can actually improve indoor air quality with energy efficiency, which is pretty neat. And then the other one that's um, forgotten is it adds value to your home. There are studies showing that uh, it can increase the value of your home when you resell it between six and 15%, depending on the market, which is pretty cool. So there's lots of positive reasons and uh, evidence-based reasons to do energy efficiency. And it's important to do it in order. So uh, this is one of those things where if you buy an air conditioner before or a, or a heater before you do weatherization and air sealing, then that expensive air that you're conditioning is going to leak outside of the house and that's going to be expensive so what you're looking at the bottom is a pyramid of things that are simple to things that are more complex things that are cheap to things that are more expensive so people love to get solar installed it's super exciting or window replacement you're like oh fireplace my windows would be better but dollar for dollar those are really expensive ways to save energy or to to work on energy efficiency they're really the last things you should do um whereas at the bottom you've got behavior changes or modifying how you're using your house. Um, and then it you know, works up from there. So this is a, a really good way to visualize how you should order and prioritize projects in your house. So the first thing you want, you can do from the list is reducing drafts and uh, increasing comfort. So the there are so many gaps and cracks in houses that if you added them all up, it could be like a two foot by two foot hole just in the side of your wall. So going around and uh, sealing up all those different places is really helpful to increase your comfort because it re reduces that expensive air going out and that cheap air coming in. Um, we already talked about that. 
Okay, and then the, the so going through the, the different reasons why you would do this. Um, so reduce it, reducing mold, moisture, and contaminants. Um, the air tightness keeps the water out. It's humid where we live in North Carolina. And so by keeping that wet air out, you reduce the chance for rot, mold, moisture, contaminants, things like that. And then of course, climate change, it helps reduce uh, the energy that's coming to our house, which a large portion of it is produced by burning coal and fossil fuels. And so reducing that load on the system can help all of us. So when you're doing uh, home energy improvements, uh, there are some dangers. So if you end up wanting to do it yourself, you should be careful as opposed to hiring a contractor. They should also be careful, but they know a little bit more about the stuff going into it. So be sure to educate yourself about uh, air quality issues specifically. If you're sealing up a place and, and you have uh, combustion appliances, then those could, if they're not working right, produce carbon monoxide that gets into your house. It's an odorless, tasteless gas. And if you don't have a carbon monoxide alarm, um, this could, this is a very dangerous problem. Of course, older houses before 19, built before 1978 could have lead paint. So watch out for that. The one on the bottom right is about radon. So radon is a naturally occurring uh, result of radioactive decay in the soil that gets into houses via basements and, and entries in the, in the base layer of the house if it's on a slab. Uh, and it's really important to mitigate that. It's actually way cheaper than people think that it is. I mean, it's probably 700 to 1200 bucks to mitigate for radon and it can save your life. So it's really important. And of course, watch out for asbestos. There's fire hazards. If you're sealing up around flues, you know, you wanna make sure you're using the right materials. And then of course, if you're, the whole house is a system, water has to escape somehow. So anyway, there's lots of different things that need to be taken into account um, there as you're educating yourself, then make sure that you're accounting for these and your energy efficiency improvements. So the a house as a whole is a, is a system. It a, works together, right? You've got the heating and you've got the outdoor sheathing, you've got lighting. And so all of the systems work together. And so what we want to do is we want to improve those systems and achieve additional energy efficiency. We can also conserve energy. So the difference between efficiency and conservation is that efficiency, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Efficiency is getting the services out of your home that you're looking for and still using, just using less energy doing it. Whereas conservation is cutting it out entirely. So conservation would be turning off the lights, <clears throat> whereas energy efficiency would be installing lights that use less energy like LEDs. So savings is important overall, whether it's conservation or efficiency, but we're not advocating reducing your comfort or the services of your home. We're advocating using technology and behavior that helps reduce your energy bill. So in a house, this is where your energy is going. And if you look at heating and air conditioning, those two add up to, let's see, 30, 42%. So a very large portion of our energy use goes into conditioning the air that's inside our house. If we address issues like air sealing or insulation, it can have a really big impact on our energy bill. And then appliances is one of those things where if like you have like a 15 year old fridge or older, you should probably replace it because the energy saving payback can be short enough to be worth it. Like some five to seven years, depends on the model and what you have right now. Uh, and then as far as water heat, um, sometimes you can put a water heater blanket on. Uh, a lot of people have their water heat set too high. Water heat should be set at about 120 degrees. <clears throat> and that's hot enough to work, but cold enough not to scald anybody for safety reasons. And also so that it doesn't have to work too hard. Like if you have a tank water heater, it's heating water to a higher temperature than you actually need for the service for, the, for that particular amenity in your house. And then the low hanging fruit is lighting and plugging devices by unplugging things or by managing your plugs better, you can save a bunch of energy. Or if you change out the lighting uh, technology or put in sensors, you can save some, some energy. So here's the basics. Set your temperatures moderately. I love, I love that one because if it's winter time and it's cold out, you can change your, your thermostat one degree, let it sit there for a day, see how it feels, do it again, do it again. And then one day when you're like, oh man, it's cold, change it back a little bit hotter. And so that kind of tells you how to moderate your temperature for your own comfort. A lot of people get really hung up on the number on the thermostat. 
but it's it's less important than actually like gauging your own comfort level and it's surprising like like how high or low you can go whether it's summer or winter and still feel comfortable because you're looking for comfort you're not looking to achieve a number on the thermostat and then i talked about heat leaks already heat loss and gain is about insulation technology can be appliances leds um there's also like in insulation of technology that can help make your house more efficient um, and then, you know, stuff deteriorates over time, so keep an eye on it, and then uh, turn off stuff when you're not using it. Heating and cooling. All right, so this is the biggest piece that we're working on, and uh, I'm new to North Carolina, and I found out that humidity in the summertime, uh oh I have too many tabs open on my screen. That was my Gmail tab telling me that my phone was ringing. So helpful. Uh, air conditioning in the summertime is really important or dehumidifying your house. There is enough humidity in North Carolina and in uh, Buncombe County where if you don't, you could actually see damage to things like flooring. Um, what happens is engineered wood or different kinds of flooring, uh, it's good at absorbing that moisture from the air and it'll start to buckle and cup and you're walking over it, you can feel the ridges of the edges of that flooring. So dehumidifying is really important, uh, especially in the summertime. Um, but there's some there's some really neat technology now with uh, cold water heat pump or cold air heat pumps, where a heat it's basically an air conditioner, and in the summertime it works to take heat out of your house, and then it flips a valve in the wintertime and it works to put heat into your house. It's very efficient, uh, and it's 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 basically it's new technology that works better than gas furnaces and it's cheaper over the long run and it lasts longer so those cold water heat pumps are definitely the way to go or sorry cold air heat pumps i don't know maybe i'm i'm i got cold water on the brain I need to go on a go on a swim or something <clears throat> so managing your thermostat is a lot easier with the smart thermostat the ecobi on the right is very similar to like a nest thermostat there's different brands and then in the middle, you've got a programmable thermostat, which works well, but you have to really uh, program it and keep up on it to make sure that you're um, managing the times of when things are. And then on the left is just a regular old, not smart thermostat, not programmable thermostat. So that managing these is all a little different. Um, I have a Nest and it's really fun on my phone because if I forget to turn it off, I can turn it off when I'm away. It's got a motion sensor, so it knows when I'm away, which is, uh, a little creepy, but also very helpful. I have people that say, well, what about my dog? Or what about my cat? They don't pay the energy bill and they will be just fine if it's five to 10 degrees off where you normally leave it. So um, gauge it for yourself and your own comfort. But when you're not at the house, you should be changing your temperature about 10 degrees off where you normally have it. So in the winter time, if you like it at like 72, 75, you could probably put it at 62 or 65. Uh, in the summertime, same thing. If you like it at like 74, 78, you could probably put it up to like 85 or 88. So setting it more towards the outdoor temperature, the slide says five degrees. You could even go 10. It just depends on what you're comfortable with. Uh, can make a big difference on your energy bill because a lot of your energy, if you recall, goes to conditioning the air inside the space. You can find drafts and cracks on your own by looking. I, I like how they use, there's an, they, well, I think it looks like an extinguished match. It, it's probably an incense uh, stick. So having something that has a visible smoke and walking around near where the windows and the doors are is a really good way to see where air is coming in. If you can see light, so like you can see out underneath that door, there's a, a gap there that you can seal up with some sort of weather stripping, in this case, a door strip, uh, a, a door sweep. You put it on the bottom or the back of the door and it closes that gap. So keeping those, like getting those drafty areas closed down makes a really big difference because then you don't have exchange of the expensive air in your house with the cheap air outside. Um, and then windows, I, I like this picture on the right there a lot because um, yes, old windows can be drafty, especially where like if you have double hung windows where they meet in the middle, can be drafty. 
Um, and some people complain about that, or I have old windows, I need new windows, but a lot of windows, it's amazing, will have cracks around them on the exterior and on the interior. So the air is literally going around the window and into your house. So that looking at just that, not even the window itself, you can see big savings and a tube of caulk is like five bucks. The good stuff is like five bucks. So um, it's a really good way to, to go around and, and save energy in your house with something that's pretty simple to do yourself if you'd like to. You can also hire a technician to do it and they'll come in and, and do it depending on the size of the house. Um, it's a hundreds of dollars kind of a thing, maybe 1200 bucks the most. Um, that shouldn't be too expensive to do because they're just buying, they're just paying the labor because the, the materials are relatively cheap. So Aaron, you typed a question, caulk goes on the outside of windows, question mark. So there's exterior caulk that you can use that painters use when they're sealing up the, like if they're, if, if it's hardy board or it's wood and they're about to paint it, they'll seal the gaps with it. So you can use that stuff. It usually says something like 15 year or 30 year exterior caulk. Um, it's not silicone. You should use silicone in places, 100% silicone in places like your bathroom or on your roof. If there's protrusions through your roof, this stuff is paintable. It's it's like a it's a water soluble. So after you're done using it, you can actually wash your hands and it comes off. As opposed to silicone, which is not, and it, when it's on there, it takes a while for it to come off. So yes, you can caulk outside of windows along the edges of the windows. I would not recommend caulking where the window matches the sill though, because then you can't open the window. So that for that, you would use weather stripping. But for this, we're talking about the trim on the outside of the windows and the trim on the inside of the windows. Is there, did I get that? Is there more on that? All right, cool. So air moves in your house, air moves everywhere. It goes from hot to cold. So it doesn't matter what the season is, the air is always moving from hotter to colder. So if it's summertime, it's trying to get into your house and if it's wintertime, it's trying to get out of your house. Either way, you want to seal up gaps, gaps and cracks. Um, the one in the middle is the, is the ceiling or the, attic floor or the other side of your ceiling and junction boxes have cracks in them as do um, holes for pipes and wires to go through so going around and sealing those up with that painter's caulk or with great stuff spray foam works really well i've done it in my own house and i would recommend hiring somebody to do it because i don't like spending that much time in my attic but if you want to chill in the attic have at it this is one it's a simple thing that you could do yourself if you want Underneath tubs and sinks, that's the, the picture on the left, it can be a little more complicated, especially if you have a slab house. Um, sometimes they'll cut a big hole in the slab and then they'll, they won't seal it up. So there'll be basically a hole in the, in the slab between your tub or your sink and the, and the dirt ground. So um, this is important to seal. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, probably foam board and some spray foam would be the way to go. Caulk is one of those things where you, if it's more than I want to say a quarter inch or a half inch. You don't really want to use caulk. You got to use some sort of foam because it's, it just won't stay in there. It'll fall out. And then on the right is a very fancy camera that, I mean, it's neat. What it does is it shows temperature differences. So in this case, it's showing cold air uh, affecting that, that wall or that ceiling. I'm not quite sure what it's pointed at. But that arrow is showing a gap where cold air is coming in through that gap and cooling, cooling off the area around it. And so you should get in there and seal that up. I think it's kind of just fancy marketing, like an energy efficiency person will pop this out and be like, you've got to do all this stuff and look at these colors and it's a big problem. And it's like, well, yeah, it's a problem, but you can also figure that out without a $600 camera. You can use an incense stick and see where the gaps are or just take a look. I mean, a lot of times you can just see where they are. So it's a neat little toy, uh, but sometimes it's, I think, a little overused for marketing as opposed to like actually just being like, we're going to seal this up because there's a gap there that you can see with your, with your regular eyeballs. Sealing up gas and cracks, cracks is really important so that you, the air doesn't flow from where it's expensive to where it's cheap. You want to keep that expensive air in your house. Um, here's additional weather, strip, weather stripping strategies. On the left is a, uh, or sorry, air sealing strategies. On the left is a weather strip that that black strip <clears throat> gets drilled into the door jam and the cushiony part faces the door. The pressure of the door pushing against the weather strip is what creates a seal. So you want to make sure it's sealed all the way around. This particular weather strip is intense. It's got screws in it. There's ones that are just adhesive um, and th those don't last as long, but they're much easier for somebody to install that doesn't know how to do it. <clears throat> in this case, if you lined it up wrong and you had to re-screw the holes, it would kind of suck because it's this beautiful wood door, right? a door jam, and so you'd have these extra holes in there. So uh, if it was painted, then you know you fill it in with caulk, you can paint it, but 
In this case, I would get a professional to do it if you want that or get the sticky stuff because it's easier. And if you mess it up, you can pull it off, put it back on. Uh, but weather stripping is cheap. It's easy. Anybody can do it. Um, and then on the right is what I was talking about before, adding caulk to the holes in the electrical junction box. Um, and they use spray foam on that hole over by the electric wire. And I think it probably would use caulk. I think the so caulk is water soluble. And when it's not silicone, it's a lot more manageable. Whereas create stuff, you gotta plan that out. I like to call it not so great stuff because if it goes where you don't want it to go, that is where it will stay. I've got some stories there, but I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and leave those on the table. Um, Jamie, can I ask a question about doors? Yes, ma'am. Okay, this is kind of a individual thing for me, but maybe a lot of old homes have this problem. My front door expands in the summer, so I have to kind of kick it open right now. In the winter, there are air leaks coming from the bottom. So do those temporary like draft stoppers, are those pretty effective? Is there a temporary measure that people can take for something like that? Great question. It's like you're a plant. How did you know? Um, so in, in your particular case, what's happening, and this is pretty common, is the door isn't properly sealed. So a lot of times it won't be painted on the door jam edge or on the bottom edge. And so the, the expansion and contraction is usually from water, from like humidity getting in there, from the heat expanding it. And then, like you said, wintertime, it dries out and contracts. Um, I had a door like this at my office a couple of years ago, my last gig, and um, we ended up painting it. And then we did the weatherization work and it seemed to work okay, but it still saw shifts. Um, we had to hire a carpenter. He actually took it off and he planed off part of the door and then painted it and then put it back and it worked. But it, um, it's a little harder than just doing the weather stripping. The, um, the managing your swelling of your door is, it could be, take a carpenter or it could take adjustment um, every year or two because of that. Um, I would go with, so these, this weather stripping, they can screw in. I don't think that that would be a problem. I think it, like they would work whether it was regular size or shrunk. Uh, I think the door sweep. So like underneath the door, that might be where you're gonna see the biggest problem. So you could use something that's adhesive as opposed to screws into the door so that you can modify it or change it, take it off, put a different one on. Um, you can still screw one in the door, take it off and put a new one on. Uh, some of them are even a little adjustable. You know, the screw holes are like ovals so you can slide it up and down. So you can try that. So there's a few options for you, um, but it's just depends on your situation. Cool, thanks. No problem. Okay, so this is what I was talking about earlier about safety. Uh, on the left here is a carbon monoxide detector. Um, this is a low level detector, which is really neat because it, 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 it can tell you even if there's a little bit in there so you can uh, adjust your combustion appliances. Um, this on the right is a combustion appliance. You, what you can tell is, it, is the, there's a flue, there's a little chimney on the top. You can see that there's an air gap at the bottom on the little legs. That's normal. It's pulling in uh, ambient air from your house uh, as the gas inside of it heats up and it helps uh, keep all that flow inside the flue. But it's a little weird when you look at it because here's this just chimney and there's these little openings in the bottom. That's actually how it's supposed to work. If uh, you're worried or your carbon monoxide detector goes off regularly or it goes off more than once or twice, you should probably call someone to come check your gas appliances, whether that's a plumber or an HVAC person, you should definitely get that taken care of. So back to the additional safety things, lead paint. This is on the left is lead paint. Watch out for that. Um, mostly it's a problem if it's ingested or it's in teeny tiny particles and you inhale it. It's like you're sanding it. So be careful about that and take proper precautions. And then on the right here is, um, I think it's underneath the crawl space. There's a lot of water that got in there and it's causing this rot in the, in the crawl space. But the, that, there's actually two pictures here. That's the top one. And the bottom one is mold on drywall. So yeah, if you've got moisture, you gotta deal with that. If you have lead paint, you should probably deal with that. These are definitely safety issues that can come up while you're doing weatherization. I talked about radon before. Radon comes in through water and soil that's coming up from the ground. Um, definitely get it tested. You can do home tests that are pretty cheap um, and you can also get it done professionally, but radon is pretty common. Uh, there's a lot of houses that have radon issues and uh, it can be really 
uh, damaging, shorten your lifespan. There's other uh, awful side effects to radon, like dementia they think might have something to do with radon, but uh, it's, it's a radioactive chemical that you don't really want in your house. So if you're sealing up the air in your house, you need to be careful that this isn't in there. It may be off gas, you can find right now, but you seal off your house some more and suddenly the concentration goes up and um, it's a problem. So definitely get tested for radon. It's a cheap and easy way to stay safe. <laughs> um, so bathroom moisture, this is the thing, you're in the shower. You don't really want the fan on because it's cold, but when you get out of the shower and you're toweled off, you should turn it on and you should turn it on until the mirror is no longer fog, fogged up because that means you've gotten that humidity that's just sitting in your house, uh, causing rot, decay, mildew, mold out of your house. So this is a point where, okay, fine, maybe the air is more expensive, but it's really important to manage moisture and getting it out of your house is critical. So there are cool energy smart bathroom fans with and without humidity sensors. And one of my teachers one time said, I don't like the ones with humidity sensors because they turn on when I'm in the shower and it's, it's cold. So keep that feature in mind when you're purchasing. It's neat and it's helpful for the moisture in your house, but it's not as good for the comfort. So uh, I usually recommend uh, bathroom fans that don't have humidity sensors that automatically kick on. So this is an attic. The top one's an attic, the bottom one's a crawl space. Um, you can see on the top one that there's some, that, that those sand looking stuff is ground up newspaper and flame retardant. It's called cellulose insulation. It's like 85% paper, 15% flame retardant. So it really won't catch on fire. That was important when they're designing it. But you can see here that on the right, it goes above the rafters. That's about how high you want it. You need a lot of insulation to stay uh, warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And in the middle here, there's not any. They probably pulled that away on purpose, but if this was your house, that big gap of insulation can be a big problem. Uh, even even a gap the size of like an attic door can reduce the overall efficacy of this blanket in your attic by like 30 or 40 percent. It's a lot, depending on the size of the gap in the insulation. So after you've done air sealing the attic floor, you want to do that first. Air seal the protrusions through the attic floor. You want a good layer of insulation. If you already have insulation in there, pink stuff, yellow stuff, this stuff, you can actually add more insulation on top without taking the old stuff out. So that's a really easy way to do it yourself. Be careful of things like vermiculite. It's a grainy kind of uh, insulation that's made of asbestos. And because um, that stuff, you don't want to breathe it in. That's that's the danger of asbestos is breathing it in or breathing in when you're moving it out of there. If you want, maybe try to do that, you'll breathe it in. So be careful of that. But if you got the pink stuff, the yellow stuff or this loose fill cellulose, you can just add more loose fill fiberglass or cellulose on top. They have a machine at the hardware store you can get for free. I did it once with Antina. It was in July. That was a terrible July in New Orleans. It was a terrible mistake. So just keep it, taking into account what the temperature of your attic is going to be when you're up there. But this is definitely something you can do yourself. Just make sure you seal the attic floor first. And then underneath the floor, um, it really depends on your situation. Um, you could use foam insulation under here. You could use uh, a foam board. Um, and if this is opening into like a basement area, you're going to might need some sort of vapor barrier. So this is a case where you might need an expert to help you sort out what's going on in that, that particular space. Um, uh, so we want our value of 49. As I said before, you can see how much insulation it takes. It's actually partially buried a duct here from the central furnace. So it's a lot of insulation to get up to R49. Uh, R49 is an insulation rating. Every building material has one from the wood in your wall to the insulation in your attic to um, the, the screws, the sheathing on your house. There's an R, they all have an R value, which is how much it resists temperature change. Um, you, you, it does helpful to have wall insulation, not as important as attic, attic insulation or insulation in the crawl space or the basement. Uh, but definitely remember to insulate your attic hatch. That's what this is on the right, is somebody's holding their attic hatch sideways and they've put insulation on top of it. And that's a lot of insulation. I mean, that's probably like seven or eight inches of insulation on top of that attic hatch. That's really important. Those gaps in the insulation really do reduce efficacy. Uh, so this is a two blower unit central system. So for either air conditioning or heat or both. 
And so you've got it one zone in the attic and one zone in the basement. The air goes into the return. It gets conditioned, either heated or cooled, and then gets pushed back out through the supply. So it's a loop that's connected to the airspace in your house. There's a lot of places that can be leaky and they're labeled here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And um, we've already talked about a lot of this stuff, but the ones that you should look at and they can probably fix yourself are things like uh, duct connections to the register, that's A. So like right where those things together, they can be leaky. All of the joints, if you pull them apart, put them back together and reseal it with mastic, which is difficult to explain in this class, but it's not as hard in real life. It's just basically like this goopy putty that's heat resistant and cool resistant. So it doesn't ex ex uh, expand and crack. It's called, this is mastic, it's blue. It's water soluble, you can wash it off, which is really nice. It's not like great stuff. If you take all those joints going into the supply and return on the main unit or all the joints between the registers and you seal those up, you can get a really high energy savings because that pressure in the system can lead to like up to 20 or 25 percent can leak out into the unconditioned space of the attic. Now, caveat here, sometimes energy systems in a house, they seal up the whole thing. They put spray foam on the, on the roof deck, they put spray foam in the basement and spray foam in the walls and it's created this one conditioned space. So if it's done that, the leaky AC or heating is less important because it's all kind of one space. If they haven't done that and you've been sealing the attic floor or sealing the basement, then those that's really important because now your HVAC system is under pressure and outside of the conditioned space. And so if it's leaky, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, but if there's some other, other things on here I'm gonna point out. G, it's a kink in the system. You want nice, long bending curves in your ductwork, or you don't want them to curve at all if you can help it. So kinks or 90 degree turns is, are really bad for efficiency because it pinches off the airflow. Uh, furniture can block registers, that's C. Um, you have on, on E is like insulation. So if the ductwork is outside your house, it's insulated and so it could have fallen off. And so it's directly touching that air outside. Uh, and I, I think I covered them all here. All the ones that are like random are like leaky register. It's like, yeah, we talked about that. So that's places where you can address duct problems. Don't let your furniture block your vents. And over here on the right, right it's literally disconnected. I, I lived in a house once where I could not figure out why it was so hot in the summer. And I went in the attic and there was a duct that was just off of the register, just like this. And so there, they, I was basically cool in the attic. I put it back on there. Oh my gosh, my air conditioner works again. It's crazy. So making sure things are connected may seem like a silly thing and small, but it makes a big difference. So there's a kinked one, like I said before, and then over here on the right, that's completely disconnected. And that is not that hard to repair. Uh, I don't know if this is a bad joke or what, but you could just use duct tape because it's a duct. I don't know if that's a joke. Uh, duct tape actually is not very good in really hot and really humid environments. Even the metal tape, the, the mastic with the fiber tape is really the way to go. And it's just, a, it's just a fiberglass tape. It's got all these holes in it. You wrap it around and then you fill it in with that mastic glue. So that's really the best way to do it. Here's more places where it can leak. These arrows are pointing to little holes that are in the joint between the supply. Uh, well, I don't know if it's the supply. It's the, where the duct goes into the main system. And then you see the same thing on the right here. You've got a square duct-ish thing and a circular one. You can see the holes that, that are in the arrows in the first one. And this is an unconditioned space. So the, the, the ducts are not insulated. They need to have insulation on them just to, to keep that blanket uh, to protect the air on the inside. Uh, <clears throat> call a professional if the system works poorly after you seal the ducts. Or call a professional to seal the ducts. I had someone do this uh, in a 1200 square foot house and it cost me like I want to say like 1200 bucks like it was totally doable and they just send a couple of people up in the attic they take apart all the joints they clean them up they put them back together and they glue them and they take the insulation they pull them apart put it back real nice tape it together glue it it's just taking all those joints and resealing them not difficult to do don't fall through your ceiling you got to stand on those rafters or on some plywood. If you stand on that drywall, you're going right through. So there's some danger in that, that area as well. So just, just be careful when you're up in the attic if you decide to go up there. Chaining filters is important. I like to 
change them every month. I'm told that's probably too much. If it's dirty, you should change it. If it's clean, you can leave it. You can also upgrade your filter to help with, uh, with like um, air quality. Um, these are places where the filter would be. Sorry, that's actually gonna show us different kinds of filters, but these are all the same. There are um, filters that with a MERV rating, which I forget what it stands for, M-E-R-V. And the higher the MERV rating, the more filtration it does. But that also means a lot of times you've got to change it more often. So it'll be more expensive and you got to change it more, but you get better air quality. So if your house is sealed up real good, you want a, a filter with a good rating because you want to get all those, top of those uh, contaminants out of the air because uh, there's no way for them to go out naturally. They're staying inside the system. So this is where you find the filters, the a wall, a wall unit, it's, it's uh, reusable. You can just rinse it out and you can buy reusable ones for your furnace and for your air conditioner as well. Um, I tend to stick with the disposable ones. I think they filter better, uh, but yeah, the, those are, you've got to replace the filter. It's not just for your health. It also helps extend the life of the system that you're using. Use Energy Star and energy guide placards like this yellow one to make sure that you're choosing an efficient model. For Blue Horizons project, we highly recommend getting a cold weather heat pump as opposed to using a fuel fired furnace. Uh, the expense is a little more upfront, but over a longer period of time, it is less. And it's better for the environment as far as if we can electrify everything and green the grid, then it helps solve the problem. Whereas if we're still burning fuels in our houses, we'll never be able to get away from controlling. So um, I mentioned this at the beginning of the slideshow. If you air, if you do things in order, if you air seal first and duct seal seal first, you can you might be able to get away with getting a smaller system if you're doing a system replacement, which is could be a significant amount of money, it could be hundreds or thousands of dollars. So this is a behavior change. If it's sunny and you want it to be cooler, close the blinds. If it's sunny and you want it to be warmer, open the blinds. It doesn't cost you anything and it can have a big difference uh, in, in the comfort of your space. Ceiling fans switch in the summertime versus the winter time. There's a little switch on the side. It's really easy to remember. Well, I think it's easy to remember. It's down in the summertime. So you put the switch down and it pushes air down and it's up in the winter time and it pulls air up and it just helps keep an even temperature uh, with your heating and your cooling and it, it makes you feel warmer in the winter and colder in the summer. So they're really helpful tools. Remember fans cool people, not rooms. When you leave the room, turn off the fan. they having the air move when you're not there. It doesn't actually do anything to change the temperature. So for water heat, um, so powered by gas or electric, when you save water, you save energy because you're saving how much hot water you're using. So a lot of times changing faucet aerators or shower heads can have an impact on your energy bill because you're changing how much water, hot water you're using. This is a thermometer. Um, you should set it at 120. That's hot enough. If you go up higher, it gets scalding um, and it can cause damage. Generally, these are in this kind of kind of a, a dial. Now there's more digital ones. The letters, this is what the letters need for temperature. So if you just get it to hot, that's usually plenty. You don't gotta crank it and it'll work just fine. It actually works the right amount instead of too much. Um, this is something that's usually built into water heaters now, but sometimes it's not. Uh, piping can cause inefficiency in your water heater. It's where there's convection and cold and uh, hot liquids where it actually makes this exchange um, in, in the water pipe. And it, and it means that your water heater has to reheat the water that's coming in cold after it's already heated the other water that's now escaped. So a water heater blanket and making sure that you have these uh, heat traps can help you with efficiency. And then uh, energy efficient water heaters are also really helpful. You can get tankless or this one on the left is the heat pump water heater. Uh, one thing is people have said they it can be kind of noisy because it's like a little air conditioner on top of the thing. So putting it in a garage or a space that you don't live in is, is helpful or even outside, but it's an expensive piece of equipment. People usually like to put it inside somewhere. Um, there's also solar hot water, which is pretty cool or hot rather, um, where you use the sunlight to heat. No, that was, that was a dad joke. My bad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, water heat uh, impacts your bill and getting the best water heater you can is important making sure it's installed correctly. Um, I don't like setting a timer for my showers. 
if you're really into this and you should do this, but I, what you could do is also just get a low flow shower head. So this is one of those handheld ones. This is the, my wife and I swear by these because even if the water pressure is a little lower than the other one, you can just, you know, go where the soap is and rinse it off instead of suffering through a low pressure one that's just stuck on the wall. So um, this was like 20 bucks at the hardware store at the low end and the high end is like 50 or 60 if you get a nice one. But every time we move somewhere, we get one of these right away because it makes a big difference, both on comfort and on energy. The circle here, that's a little aerator on your, on your sink. Um, it says gallons per minute, 5.6. It adds air to the, to the water. And so it feels like the same amount of air pressure, but it, or water pressure, but it's actually less because there's air in there. So it's just a way to get the same service for less money on, on energy efficiency, especially with saving the hot water. Um, you want to look for one and a half gallons per minute or less for uh, shower heads, one gallon per minute or less for faucet aerators. Um, the, the shower heads, I think they get as low, low as like 0.7. I use one. I was not a fan. I could definitely tell a difference. So definitely, um, you know, you can try it out. Uh, you can try low and see how you like it. Um, these you want to, the thing about this stuff is you want to retain the service that you're getting and the comfort that you're getting, or you're going to resent it. So getting something that is really efficient, but you're suffering through it doesn't really solve the problem. You want to find stuff that's both comfortable and saves energy. Oh my gosh. CFL light bulbs were the worst thing ever for environmentalism. That's a personal opinion, not one of the program. Uh, I just think as an environmentalist for 20 years, I've been pushing CFLs and complex fluorescent light bulbs are a pain in the butt. They have funny light, they buzz, they die after two or three years. They're very, um, I don't like the color of them that are available. And then they have mercury in them. So you've got to dispose of them special. LEDs on the other hand are an excellent technology. It's about one seventh of the power that an incandescent bulb uses. You can get it in any color. You can get LEDs that change color. So maybe you want something that's nice and cool like sunlight in the bathroom, in the kitchen, and then you have friends over and you want ambiance and you can have LED, you can buy LEDs that you can change it to candlelight instead of sunlight. So excellent technology, super affordable now. The prices have come down a lot and you can save it's, it's literally a seventh of the energy. So yeah, okay, one light bulb, whatever. It's like a, you know, five or six bucks a year. But if you have 20 or 40 of these things in your house, it's a huge difference. So instead of buying a 45 cent incandescent bulb, buy a $1.27 LED and you, it's your golden. Oh, and they last forever. They never die. They just slowly dim over time and they say, okay, well, they'll last 13 years. So they'll last 20 years. So it's, I'm, I'm very into LEDs. I feel like CFLs did the environmental movement a disservice. Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. And you can get free ones from Duke too, if you go online. Uh, appliances cost money. Um, one thing that Summer does that I'm very impressed with is she line dries her clothes. And I've, I've done this before in the past. My house is kind of small now. It's hard to find space for it, but it doesn't use anything when you hang your laundry up. So that's it's a pretty easy way to save energy. Um, remember, the fuller the load, the better. It uses the same amount of energy no matter what you put in there. So if you have a dishwasher or a, or a washing machine, fill it all the way up. And uh, there's all it's not on this slide, but um, dishwashing, I've, I'm told that you use less water in a dishwasher than you do when you're hand washing a dish. So instead of hand washing dishes, if you use a dishwasher, you could save some water and some, uh, some energy. Uh, shut off devices when you're not using them. This one on the right is a smart power strip. Um, you it actually like switches it on and off other systems. So like the master switch there on the green one, on the top, that's like your TV and then like your DVD player, your Xbox, all this other stuff goes in those other green switches. When the master switch turns off, it kills the power to all those other ones. So you, you don't have that vampire load. Back in the day, it was a VCR that would flash 12. That's, that's standby mode, that's costing you money. Um, thoughts on an induct, the question in the chat says, we have a brand new electric range, but are considering an induction stove, thoughts on induction. We also don't want to waste new appliance if we can't sell the current range, right? It's hard to get rid of something that's pretty new if you're trying to save energy. It's a balance that you kind of, everyone's got to kind of figure out where they're comfortable with. I'm told that induction has a similar uh, cooking feel as gas. 
I don't know. I, I, you know, I didn't used to cook before the pandemic and I had an induction stove. I didn't like it very much. Now I cook on gas. And I kind of regret not having an induction stove. It's almost like I'm stuck in this Goldilocks problem. The grass is always greener. Our colleague Leah, if she was on the call, would jump in right now and correct me and say, no, Jamie, induction is excellent. We should all use induction because it cooks like gas. So I think I need to give it a second try. Um, I myself would be reluctant to swap out a brand new range with another range unless you're seeing like you're cooking on it and you just don't like it. Um, you'll save some energy with induction versus electric because electric uses resi resistance heat and induction uses magnets, uh, which is just a lot more energy efficient. But as far as the payback, I don't think you're going to get a ton of energy payback on that. It would be more about um, the kind of uh, cooking you're doing and how you feel doing it. In general, I like to wait for appliances to like get too old and then replace it as opposed to uh, replacing them with a new. So I understand. Um, with light bulbs, that's not true. If you have new incandescent light bulbs, throw them in the garbage and get new LEDs. You will save so much money. So with light bulbs, you should get rid of them new or not. But appliances, I struggle because it's hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars. Uh, we talked about this already, uh, air dryer clothes. If you turn off the heat dry on your dishwasher and just open it and let it air dry, I have a little fan next to my dishwasher, so I just open it and turn it on. Uh, save, you'll save much energy because that heating is using uh, heating elements, which are expensive. And then you need to maintain things. This is just a bunch of different clogged up things in a dryer system. You've got a, on the right, you've got the lint catcher inside the system. On the far left, you've got the duct that actually came off and is now emptying in some sort of space in the wall or the attic. It's disgusting with all that lint. And then on the bottom, it gets caught outside and there's actually a little dryer flap door there that's being held open by the, the debris there. So that's gross. So just, just make sure you clean it all. You should, you should empty the dryer trap every load and it will help with the other pieces of it, like the tube, the duct, and then the outdoor, outdoor vent. Energy bills change with seasons. The ones April, May, October, November, it's called the shoulder season because it kind of looks like a head and a shoulders. In the summertime, we use electricity for air conditioning. In the wintertime, we use electricity for electric heating. And that's usually where we're using our en energy. If you use gas or you use something else to heat or cool your home, if you add up all your energy needs together, it will still create this pattern because it's a seasonal need. And then again, you should start at the bottom, move your way up. That's where you find the most energy efficiency savings is at the bottom of the pyramid moving up. Um, there, so federal tax credits for solar, if you want to get solar, are starting to go away. Um, they're, they're, they're being uh, staged down over time. Um, also, Ener Duke Energy has solar rebates, but it's really weird. Not everybody gets it. You, all, you have to have it installed and then file for it, and then there's a lottery. And so they just closed the lottery, I think, last week. Another one will happen again in three or six months. And then we have um, national installers that come in, but there are local installers. So supporting the local folks is really important because that's local jobs, local money. We partner with Summit and with Sugar Hollow, but there are a couple other really good installers as well, and they're in our directory. And uh, there you go. We're going to bump in with have FBE. Is that a uh, co op? I'm kind of new around here. Oh, I, that's the first I heard of it. The co ops don't usually, just don't generally have an, uh, incentives like the big investor owned utilities do. But I don't know. I think we have to look that up and get back to you. That's a good question. I didn't know there was a co-op in town. Aaron, do you have any? Do you have any other questions? It's the Aaron show today. So anything you have about your particular house, or uh, or you can follow up later with a phone call or an email. I'm happy to do it that way too. I okay, can cool. just throw in for sake of the recording that if anyone decides to contract out work, um, go to greenbuilt.org and see all of the members of Greenbuilt Alliance that are also committed to green building and sustainable building in Western North Carolina. And you can see some companies that we trust to do the work on there. Thanks, Summer. Maybe next month we can do coffee in real life. Is that crazy talk? An energy efficiency coffee talk. All right, with that, 
Thanks so much. Have a good day. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you out there.